I think I can do. Thank you. Great. Um, so uh, let's talk about the quantum supremacy experiment. Uh, the basic idea behind this is people have been talking about quantum computing for what 30 years now, that it could be very powerful, solve certain problems really well. And uh, what the idea in the quantum supremacy is to actually show that you could build a powerful quantum computer. And it's kind of funny because I think to physicists, we all we trust quantum mechanics. We was pretty sure this would work and we have to do all the research. But if you talk to computer scientists, you talk to uh, hardware engineers, uh, you especially talk to uh, Silicon Valley executives. I mean, they, this sounds very mysterious and is it really gonna work? And I also, you know, of course, the government funding agents. So uh, we thought it would be really good uh, for the support of our field. After all, there's been billions of dollars put into it already and they, we want billions of dollars more to make this happen. It's a hard problem to build a quantum computer. Let's show some experimental evidence that at least the quantum computer is powerful. Now, of course, after you do powerful, you then have to make it useful and that's even harder and that's the next thing. But, uh, but you know, let, let's, let's see if the basic science is gonna work and you can do it. So the basic idea in the quantum supremacy experiment was we run a, a very simple crafted algorithm on a quantum computer uh, and took data for about 200 seconds. And if we wanted to check that data, then it would, you'd have to run it on a supercomputer for something like 10,000 years, very long time. And that's, thus you know that the quantum computer is, is way more powerful. Uh, and the, the basis for all this is kind of this parallel computation you get in quantum mechanics on huge uh, computational space or state space, uh, about two to the 53 or 10 to the 16. And it's such a big number, you, you really see the, 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 fidel, the, 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 the power. Um, the important part of this is to just show that the quantum computer is actually going to work and decoherence and errors aren't going to overwhelm you, either for practical or fundamental reasons, and we tested that. And in fact, there's really good news here that there's no additional decoherence physics when we scale up to this huge uh, thing. We didn't know that uh, necessarily before. And then finally, uh, there are some new things we can do with it. And I'll talk about that at the end, some of the experiments people are running now. Okay, so um, let's just, very simple. Why is a quantum computer interesting? Normally you encode information as bits, zero and one, and using a quantum computer, you can encode them as quantum states, which for example, can be in a superposition of zero plus one. And what this essentially allows you to do is run the zero, one, zero plus one state through the quantum computer at the same time, effectively uh, solving for the answer for zero and answer for one simultaneously in a parallel way. So that's great, one qubit, factor of two, yeah, okay, that's not such a big, big deal. But what you do is you start adding qubits. And if you have two qubits, your parallel processing of these four states three qubits, eight states, four, 16, 532, and the amount of parallel processing is growing exponentially with the number of qubits. And that exponential power is what you really wanna take advantage of in the quantum computer. So by the time you get to 50 qubits, two to the 50 is large enough that, again, that's what we show here, you're competing against a supercomputer. And by the time you get, say, to 300, to the 300 is more states than there are atoms in the universe. And clearly, you know, you would be doing something that you could never do with the classical computer. Now, however, of course, when you run this, in the end, you have to measure your quantum states and you get, for the last case, 300 bits of output. So you get kind of a reduced amount of information. And the problem with quantum computing is figure out algorithms to take advantage of this parallelism even though when you're measuring it, you get a much smaller subset of all the total data. And there are algorithms and people are figuring out how to do that, but it's not like you can solve any arbitrary problem with it. But it opens up a, a whole new class of algorithms that people can think about. So I'm an I'm experimentalist, I build hardware. I've been working on superconducting qubits since graduate school in the early 1980s. 
uh, and uh, they, they have some advantages some in these things. So here's a picture on the left, and the metal is the gray, and this dark uh, uh, dark brown is where there's a there's an insulator. But these uh, qubits are uh, you know a, a fraction of a millimeter in size. You can see them with your eye, uh, and uh, because they're they're macroscopic, they're easy to control. So for example, these lines here are wires that come in and control the biases and change and can, can control the qubit in, in, in some way. So having big atoms, you know, if you like, uh, makes it easier controlled. This is, uh, it has engineered properties, so we can design this using circuit theory and electromagnetism. And this is built like a computer chip with integrated circuit fabrication. So it's hard to get one or a few qubits working but once you do that and you understand the physics and all the engineering, you can then kind of mass produce it using the huge amount of technology we already have for this. So that, that's our kind of advantages to the superconducting qubit. In terms of how we're gonna use it, we're, we're using something called the transmon qubit invented by the Yale groups. And this is basically a nonlinear electrical resonator at about five gigahertz, okay? So what happens is in purple, there's a, a capacitance from the purple leads to the ground plane all around it, that's a capacitor. And then at the bottom, we have these two crossed metal wires with form a Josephson junction, just two aluminum skinny wires uh, with a thin insulating barrier, so a Cooper pairs tunnel through it. So you get a supercurrent and that supercurrent looks like a kind of a nonlinear kinetic inductance. Uh, so that you have the inductance of the Josephson junction resonating with the capacitor uh, forming an oscillator. Now it turns out when you work out the equations of motion for this, this is nothing but a, uh, a pendulum, okay? And we all know the physics of a pendulum. We know that it's linear at small ap uh, amplitudes, but at high amplitudes, the oscillation frequency goes down. And that's really good because then you can isolate the zero and one states from the, the one, two or two, three transitions. So zero and one is typically five gigahertz and one to two is 4.8 and two to three is 4.6. So if you use, use a long enough pulse, all you're gonna see is those two states. And you know, given semi-classically on the right, the zero state is a ground state, the one state is the first excited state. Below that, I give you the wave functions. They kind of more or less looks like a harmonic oscillator wave functions, but it's just you have this nonlinearity built in that allows you to only see the, the two qubit states. And in that sense, it's kind of easy to understand from a classical, semi-classical method what's going on. And you put the quantum mechanics in to get the full prediction, but you can use a lot of your intuition from uh, uh, just circuit theory, uh, regular electronics to design it, which is very, very helpful. Just to show how it works, uh, this is a single qubit. On the left kind of represents the sequence that we do in time. We just let it decay to the ground state by waiting a long time. We then pulse on five gigahertz microwaves, uh, which creates a zero to one and one zero transition. Uh, and then uh, we wait a certain amount of time and then we do a measurement of the state, which we get a zero or one, as you expect from quantum mechanics. And then we repeat that a thousand or 10,000 times to get a probability. So the plot on the right is just what the probability to be in the ground state versus the time of the microwaves. And you see that it's oscillating up and down called Rabi oscillations and between uh, you know, probability of one and zero, okay? As you would expect for a good quantum bit. Now, if you look at this, uh, this point right here at 20 nanoseconds, pulsing it for 20 nanoseconds, that it's sending the zero state into the one state. And that's logically what you would think about as a not gate. And if you double the pulse time from 20 to 40 nanosecond up here, it now is going back to the zero state. So a 20 nanosecond pulse is a not, two 20 nanosecond pulse is an identity, uh, so it kind of looks like a classical information in that. However, you can pulse it for 10 nanoseconds and you see that if you pulse it for 10 and another 10, you get a knot. So in analogy, you kind of think of that as a square root of knot 
uh, gate, uh, which creates the state zero plus one, which I was talking about previously. But I think the more important thing is in quantum logic, you have a larger kind of uh, gate space that you can design your algorithms with taking advantage of uh, this, uh, this, these quantum states. And with these enhanced set of logic operations, which is self-consistent, you can, you, can, uh, you can design a logic family that totally makes sense from that. Uh, you can then uh, build these more complicated algorithms. So, uh, you know, that's the added functionality you have with quantum than classical that allows you to do these, these nice things. Uh, please note here that you have these great oscillations, but they are decaying in time a little bit. And that small decay took I don't know, 20 years for the field to figure out it was hard to do, but eventually we were able to do that. And you basically have a memory time of your qubit of around 20, maybe 30 microseconds for these qubits. Other qubits are longer, maybe a few hundred uh, uh, microseconds to even milliseconds now. But there's a finite lifetime of, of the state and you have to take into account that when you build algorithms. And I'll talk about that more in a, in a little bit. Uh, so uh, you, people have been making qubits for a long time and to do this quantum supremacy experiment, we need 50 or so qubits. So uh, this is our processor shown on the left. It's a square grid of, of qubits. The, uh, the gray cross is the qubit. Uh, and then each qubit is essentially connected to its four nearest neighbors through what is new for this experiment is this adjustable coupler in blue. And I'll explain how that works. And uh, basically you have this 2D array and this 2D array enables you to do the quantum supremacy experiment. But what's really nice, it's forward compatible to doing uh, error correction and making more and more complex machines. So in some sense, we're testing the basic idea of whether we know how to scale up uh, a quantum computer uh, in this way. So there's a lot of new things uh, that we had to invent to get here. And what's really nice about this is it's fast and has low errors and uh, all the things you want. Now on the right, you see the chip. The bottom chip is basically the wiring, which you can see how we have pads on the outside, a hundred and, and some pads going into the inside. And then we have another chip on top of it that contains the qubits that's connected to the bottom chip via indium bump bonds. And this is kind of a standard technology, although we had to have a few modifications to get it for, to work for, uh, for uh, superconducting. This is about uh, you know, a few centimeters across. And then uh, here's the chip. And then we then put it into a package, which is basically, we have a circuit board with some shielding around it. We wire bond from the pads to the circuit board, and then we bring it to an array of uh, coaxial uh, connectors, uh, which we then uh, connect to the, the, the chip to do all the control. And we put it inside this dilution refrigerator. That's about a uh, little bit more than a half a meter across. You can see the chip in here. And then we just have a bunch of SMA connectors going from the chip, eventually up the room temperature with a bunch of filters and uh, preamplifiers at the bottom here. And, all you know, the electronics you need. Uh, the dilution refrigerator gets to about 10 or 20 millikelvin. And that way the, the, and the energy KT is much less than H bar omega, which is about 0.2 Kelvin for these five gigahertz devices. And then you're in the quantum regime. The thermal noise doesn't overwhelm you and you can see the, the quantum, quantum behavior. And uh, you know, these are commercial dilution refrigerators. You figure out the wiring you can see it's kind of brute force approach. And at the right here, you can see the wires coming out of the cryostat and then it going to racks of a custom electronics. And these are each of these are uh, eight channel gigahertz D to A converters, custom build high speed, low noise. And that controls all the waveforms going into the qubit to control it. And then with an amplifier chain, we can measure the state of the qubits and digitize this on some of the cards and then figure out whether it was a, a zero or one. So you're, it's, it's kind of looking like a high energy physics experiment. You know, that's okay, that's what we have to do. And you know, we just brute force it in the beginning just to see how things are gonna work. And then obviously as we wanna scale up, we have to miniaturize this more, but for right now, 
doing science experiments, showing demonstrations. This is very flexible and easy, and you just have to learn. You just have to get over the fact that you have to, you know, just do mass wiring like that. And it can be done. It, was, it wasn't clear in the beginning, but it can be done. I want to talk a little bit about the two qubit gate because that's what's new and kind of important for the bytes. Kind of neat how it works. We have the nonlinear oscillator of the nonlinear Joseph's injunction inductance and the capacitor. So these are the, the qubits, which I was talking about. We have a line coming in here into this loop and that puts a magnetic field in the loop. And that actually changes, it's a squid, it changes the critical current, changes the inductance, it changes the oscillation frequency of the qubit. Uh, and then the qubit is read out via this line right here through standard what's called dispersive readout. The interesting thing is the coupler, and the coupler comes about through another qubit. Okay, again, it's tunable qubit. And then we have capacitor coupling between this qubit to this qubit and this qubit to this qubit. Well, what happens is this qubit is set at a higher frequency than this qubit. So you kind of have an off resonance behavior here. So this qubit drives this qubit and then partially rings up, it's off resonance. And because this frequency of the qubit is less than this, it sees an inductive response. So there's an 180 degree phase shift. And then this response through the capacitor here drives the other qubit. So this is two coupled oscillators with the coupling with a minus sign. So that basically looks like a negative capacitor. And the nice thing is, is that negative capacitor depends on the frequency difference between, uh, between uh, the, the coupler and the qubit, which we can adjust with this line here through the squid. So it's a negative adjustable capacitance. And then we put a physical capacitor across the device and at some particular frequency, those two capacitances add up to zero and then it's off. And then we move off that frequency and we turn on the coupling and then, and then it's on. So the show, <coughs> how it works. Here's an experiment where we take two qubits and we do a not gate on one of the qubits so that it puts it in the one state. And then we bring the qubits on resonance and we turn on the couplers. And uh, in that case, you should get a swapping back and forth between uh, the, the, the excitation between the two qubits. It's just like, you know, two coupled oscillators that we've studied extensively in, uh, in physics. And you let it couple back and forth for a while, and then you turn it off and measure it, and you see if it oscillates. So here's the data on the bottom. The, the color is the population transfer. Let's go at zero bias right here. Initially, there's no transfer, and then you see dark blue, and it's transferred, light, dark, light. And this is just the oscillation between the two states in the center. And then if you put current through the, the, the center qubit, and lower the frequency at some point to two capacitances, add the zero. There's no oscillation. This is the off state. And then if we go a little bit beyond, we turn it on again, and then we can actually get pretty fast oscillations here to turn on the strong coupling. And uh, this allows us, this experiment allows us to uh, uh, calibrate the device to see if it's going right. And this actually is experimental data. It kind of looks like we generated it with a computer, but the, the qubits are really good and stable now, and you can get the very good data out of this. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's nice. Now, before I get on to the, the real experiment, I want to talk a little bit about maybe what seems like a detail, but it's actually really important. And the thing is, is you have to tell how good, you have to measure how good your gates are. And the fundamental problem with quantum computing is that you intrinsically have errors. You know, your qubit will radiate, you can have frequency shifts, a lot of things can go wrong. And uh, as opposed to classical bits or can be made intrinsically stable, you really have to measure and, and work hard to make this. And this has been happening for many decades now. And especially what happens is you can get one qubit to work well, but when you start making an array of them, you can have some funny crosstalk behavior. A lot, a lot of things can go wrong. And you have to measure whether the qubits are working properly. And you know, you don't want to try anything until you know that it's working okay. 
So what we do is a, a variety of experiments to check if it's working right. The first experiment we do is say, look at a single qubit, put all the other qubits off resonance, we turn off all the couplers, so we're just looking at one qubit. And then we measure the gate performance of that qubit by putting in a bunch of knot and square root of knot gates and changing the state around and then seeing if the state at the end was the state that we expected it to be. So we, we do all these gates, we put in the zero state at the end, was it the zero state? And by measuring the probability of zero state versus the number of gates, you can get an error per gate. And when you do that, those errors are around 0.1%. So you can do about a thousand operations before you get an error. And given that these are 20 nanosecond uh, gates and there's about 20 microsecond coherence time, that's all make that makes sense. And then you do that on all the separate qubits and you get a more or less a Gaussian distribution. And I like to plot it as an integrated, uh, which, is more, uh, which, is, which is this curve right here. And you can tell kind of the average here is a little bit worse than 10 to minus three errors, but it's fairly tight and there's some distribution and that's great. Now, the thing that's, that's really interesting is to say, if you're running a real quantum processor, you are running all the qubits at the same time. That's what goes on in your computer, in your cell phone. All you know, a, a large number of transistors are switching at the same time. And the obvious question is, when you have all of them working at the same time, are you going to get good results? So what we do is all the couplers are off, but we're, we're controlling all the qubits at the same time. And we again do this measurement of what the errors are, and that's in the black line. And, you know, okay, as expected, you expect it to be worse. But what was nice is it was, you know, very small, 0.01% worse, just a tiny bit worse. And that basically proves that we've done all our engineering right, and we have the couplers turning off well, and everything's working right. And it's what you need to do a quantum computer. So we call this simultaneous measurement, and everything works right. Okay, so we can do the same thing for two qubit errors, and it's a little bit worse at, with two qubit as one. You expect a factor of two, it's a little bit more, but that's okay. Now when we do simultaneous, the errors get up a little bit bigger. There's more opportunities for crosstalk and problems, and people are working on that, but it's still kind of acceptable. It, it's, that's not a surprise here. Uh, and uh, in the end, you can, you can figure out, uh, you know, what's going on. So you need to measure all the qubits. You need to see the distribution. You have to isolate simultaneous to know really what's going on with these things. And the nice thing is, is these errors are low. It's kind of record low for a complex system. And thus, we should be able to do complex algorithms. That's good. Quantum computer looks like it's working. But, well, what happens when you run, you know, a complex algorithm that has to be tested out, of course. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, uh, it's a little bit technical, but uh, let's talk a little bit about calibration. I mean, to get these qubits to work, each one of them are kind of unique and has to be tuned up. So you need to tune up uh, these devices. So this is our calibration graph uh, that tells you kind of how it works when you have no information about the system and you go all the way and calibrate the whole thing. And you know, there's a lot of steps, there's a lot of things to calibrate. To kind of normalize what you're doing here, these two points here was uh, the PhD thesis of you know, one of my students at UC Santa Barbara. So you can think of this as, you, know, you, you take all this knowledge of your, your graduate students to get this thing right, and then you write code to, uh, you know, essentially put them out of business, okay, so that you can automate it. Of course, you're not really putting them out of business. It means they can do more interesting things than calibrate qubits, okay? And you have to do that because, uh, you know, it's, you have to automate it, you have to systematize it. And that's actually the hard part about building a quantum computer is doing the calibration and figuring out some systematic way. But it can be done. And, uh, you know, you can, in, in the end, we, we, we cool down the chip, we hit calibrate, and let's say initially in a day, it figures out everything. And then you want to recalibrate over time, and now the recalibration is down to, I think, a few, even a few minutes uh, to make sure everything's tuned up right once you have all the information. This is a huge part, uh, huge part of, of doing this. So a lot of software, you have to write software well. Okay. 
So let's go on to the quantum supremacy experiment. And actually, before we even get there, let's talk about how you're going to program the quantum computer. So on the right, I have a, a motion uh, diagram where the, the, the single circles are a single qubit operation. And then it's interleaved with two qubit operation where there's a line between the, 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 uh, the circles. So you're interleaving single qubit two qubit, it's happening across the whole array. And since each qubit is connected to its four nearest neighbor qubits, the two qubit uh, operations kind of cycle around uh, the individual ones. And you can look at, for example, a central qubit on the, the left here, the lower left, and it's connected to its four nearest neighbors. And there you can see the, the, uh, the whole sequence, how everything is going on simultaneously. We have single qubit gates and then two qubit gates, single qubit gates, two qubit gates, and it cycles through there. So uh, this is the general uh, purpose algorithm. You wanna run any quantum computing algorithm on this device, this is what you would do. And, uh, and what we've done is for the quantum supremacy experiment, we've kind of taken the simplest a quantum algorithm, in fact, you can imagine. It's actually very simple and, and very powerful. Whereas on the single qubit dates, you take a known gate, but it's randomly chosen square root of not gate with three different phases, zero, 90 degrees, and 45 degree phases on the microwave drive. And then the two qubit gate is a known, uh, more or less a square root of swap operation, kind of what we were looking at earlier. And uh, you then uh, run, uh, run that algorithm and get the measurement at the end. And over here, you see that the single qubit errors are about, time is about 25 nanoseconds, microwave pulses, and the two qubit gates where you're changing the qubit frequency and turning on the couplers. In fact, it's, it's faster. Two qubit gates are faster at about 12 nanoseconds. And of course, we do that across the whole array. Now, Let's talk about the quantum su supremacy algorithm and uh, what it does. And, and what's nice about quantum supremacy, it actually checks whether our quantum computer is working properly. This is probably the most important thing about the quantum uh, supremacy. So what happens is you, you run this experiment. It kind of looks like a randomizing uh, the device, and then you, you measure it at the end. And what happens when you measure it at the end is you can get any of the two to the end states, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. You can get all, all those states. However, some of those states are going to have higher probability than other states. And the way to understand that is to think about laser speckle. You put a coherent laser light through frosted glass, and it diffuses out. And when you look at the light coming out in some directions, you can see here of a picture the light is brighter and some is, is less bright. And in some directions you had, uh, you could add adding, info, info, uh, uh, adding interference. And in some directions you have subtracting interference and it gets dim. And the same thing happens here as this goes through here, kind of the random but coherent nature of this means that some states are brighter and some states are dimmer. Some states are more probable, some states are less probable. And basically the quantum supremacy is we sample the states that we get out there through the quantum computer and we check whether those were the bright states or where it was an average state. And you check that by actually taking your circuit and running it through a classical, say, supercomputer, if it's big enough, and getting the probabilities and then doing what's called a cross entropy where you take the states that you measured but you compute the probability uh, that, uh, uh, that you computed. And if it's randomly chosen, that probability is one over two to the n, and the fidelity is equal to zero. But if you uh, have coherence, the probability will be higher than one over the two to the n. And when we're through, through the mathematics, that fidelity turns into one. And in fact, it's very nice because it's even more, um, more complicated than that in that if it's a perfect match, there's no decoherence, you get a fidelity of one. And if there's any error at all, you get a zero. And any error is if there is a bit flip or a phase flip anywhere in the circuit, let's say from decoherence 
But let's also say that you didn't calibrate it right, or you made an error in your uh, in your algorithm. You know, the whole software chain. You make any error at all, it's going to be zero. So it's really good uh, me metric for telling if you know what you're doing as you scale up, because you're not going to get any signal at all if you made a mistake. So so it's it's, it's really a very very powerful algorithm, and it's very robust uh, uh, to do that. And of course, in terms of quantum supremacy, this is this when you get the 50 qubits is complex and difficult to simulate. So, uh, so uh, you can use it for that too. Okay, so let's now talk about the quantum supremacy data. And here is with a 14 cycle, so that's 15 single qubit error, single qubit operations, and 14 two qubit neighboring operations. And we go from uh, 12 qubits to, uh, uh, to 53 qubits on the data here. And let's just take the 12 qubit case and the 12 qubit with uh, the 14 cycles has about 250 single and two qubit gates total. So it's a complex calculation. And when we do the cross entropy benchmarking, that fidelity is about 40%. So almost most of the time, 40% of the time, it works without any errors and we get the result and fine. And then about 60% uh, of the time, there was one or more errors. And, and, and on those cases, the fidelity was zero. So you average that up and, and that's what you get. Now, as you do this with more and more qubits, the fidelity is gonna drop because you have more and more gates and there's more and more chance that you're gonna have an error. And you know from classical probability, if you think about uh, you know, the errors as you build a system bigger and bigger, uh, that fidelity should go down exponentially, which it does. You see more or less a line on a, on a log scale and it goes down and down. And uh, in this region right here, up to, I know, 30 qubits or so, you're looking on your laptop, and then above 30 or more, you're starting to use a workstation. And then at the end, uh, you're using a supercomputer or a Google data center and running it for hours and hours, okay? So it gets really hard fast once you get beyond 30 or 40 qubits. But the nice thing is, is it has this simple exponential and you still have a st statistically different signal compared to zero uh, at, the, at the, the biggest ones. I mean, the, you know, the, most of the, the times it, it's not working, but there's enough fraction of times that it's working that you're knowing it's working properly. Now, what's nice is you can check this in a variety of ways. So the check experiment is one is doing what we call a patch circuit, where we take all the qubits and then cut them kind of in two by not doing two qubit gates between the two patches. And because the computational complexity is exponential with the number of qubits, when you cut it into two patches, you just separate out what's going on in the two patches. And that's way simpler to calculate. And in that case, for the patch circuits, which is the blue crosses, it more or less uh, falls on top of the data for the red circles, the full circuit. And you know, you're not changing the number of gates very much, so you expect it to be more of the same. And then you can do something kind of in between where you cut out some of the two qubit gates. We call that a lighted circuit. Again, that's simpler to calculate, and, but there's still entanglement going on between the two, and you again gets the same, the same results. So it's nice because we can check things even in the cases where it gets computationally hard to check. Okay, so it's five hours, uh, but you still wanna show quantum supremacy. The way you do that is you, you actually change your sequence a little bit. There is a mathematical trick here that made this easier to calculate. You do a sequence that gets rid of that mathematical trip. And now if you want to simulate classically from uh, you know 53 qubits from more and more number of rounds, it's gonna take weeks or years or millennia to do that. So we actually can't check it anymore for the full circuit. However, we can check it for the alighted and patch circuits because that's still computationally reasonable. And that's shown here uh, and here, including five sigma error bars. It's statistically significant compared to zero, so we know the quantum computer is working properly. And since we showed that these were good proxies on the left hand, we are very confident that if we actually could run 
the full circuit on a, on a supercomputer that it would follow these lines and everything would be great. And we'd actually archive the data. So if people want to try and they have a new algorithm, you know, they can, they can further verify what's going on. So, uh, so this, this shows that the, 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 the quantum computer is working properly and, uh, and, and shows that you've, you've done a calculation that, you know, you really can't solve right now. Uh, and, and you see what, what's going on with that in the future. I want to talk now a little bit about the quantum science results, because this is actually the most important part of the experiment. Uh, not maybe even most newsworthy, but for science, this is really important. And the first thing I want to point out is we get the same fidelity, whether we run the full circuit or partial circuits of alighted or patched, and even predicted uh, circuits, which I'll talk about in a minute. And this basically says that the errors that you get in this complex quantum uh, calculation does not depend on entanglement. It does not depend on computational complexity. Okay. And that's actually what we expected from quantum computing, but it's really good news because it means that you should be able to build a complex calculation with the quantum computer and nothing horrible is going to go wrong in, uh, in, uh, in the calculation, and in, in the, the physics allows you this. So let me talk a little bit more about that in detail. Um, one of the things we did, and I'll just go back to here, the black line here is the prediction of the fidelity from a single qubit measurements and two qubit measurements that we did that I showed you in a prior slide. And you just take those measurements and you use the dumb the high school classical physics, that the fidelity of the whole system is just the product of the individual fidelity. So it's 0.99 something to the nth power, okay? And you just multiply all the fidelities you measure. And it's amazing that you can use this classical probability that doesn't take into account any of the coherences or whatever, just classical probabilities, and you can predict the, uh, the errors of the whole device. And that's kind of nice because you, you, you want it to be that way for it to work. And in fact, things like error correction and all the theories describing the quantum computer makes that assumption. And it's really important to show experimentally that that's really true. And there are reasons why it's true that it worked right. But you know, in the end, you can engineer everything and do the physics right and get that to work. So again, that's very, very good news, very big thing. Uh, quantum works at a two to the 53 or 10 to the 16 Hilbert space. It's been previously tested to about a thousand Hilbert space. So we've expanded our knowledge of quantum mechanics working on a Hilbert space that's 10 to the 13 times bigger than what we've uh, seen before. And again, it's, it's working in, in very much detail uh, of this. And it's kind of amazing that nothing new goes, goes wrong. There's no new physics that we saw there. And again, that's good news, but not necessarily uh, obvious in the beginning that that would happen. And finally, I'd like to say that um, this thing tests the model of digitized errors. And this is a plot here of the fidelity as we're putting in a, a phase flip gate. But instead of either no phase flip or a phase flip, it's a continuous phase between zero and 360 degrees. And what we see is at 180 degrees, where there's a full phase flip error, the fidelity goes to zero, which is what I said earlier, you get a phase, you get a phase or bed flip goes to zero, but you see that it follows a cosine squared uh, behavior here, which is exactly just kind of the prediction of a, of a, a partial rotation and thinking about, about it as either no error or error. And this is the as basic assumption that goes into uh, um, uh, error correction and how quantum mechanics works. And people expected this, but it's nice to show that even embedded in the middle of a really complex uh, 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 calculation, this assumption still works. And again, this is what we needed to work in order to do error correction. So th this, is, this is quite good. Um, I, yeah, I have a few minutes. Let me talk about uh, the uses of a quantum computer and what we're going to do it. 
Uh, it turns out that the quantum supremacy experiment actually has a use in the cryptographic world when people really about really worry about security. And in fact, this experiment I'll describe, it's kind of hard for physics, physicists to understand why this is important, but people who understand cryptography, this is really interesting. So bear with me and I'll answer questions about this. But the, the basic problem is um, uh, in crypto systems is trusting that the system is doing what you want. And you can imagine a hacker somehow building a system where it spoofs the data between some random number generator and a computer. So for example, uh, let's say someone votes and then before the vote is tallied, the vote gets changed in some way to use maybe a current example, okay? And how do you, you know, how do you know that that's right? Or in the computer, you generate a random number, but the hacker is pulling it from a list of known numbers uh, so uh, so he, he's going to know what the result is going to be. So how do you prove that it actually is a random number? Because the spoof data can have all the randomness that you would expect. And there's actually a solution to this using the quantum uh, supremacy, where the random number generator is generated with, uh, with a quantum computer with a timestamp. And you can actually prove that that random number came from a quantum computer and thus you know that it's random. Okay, so how does that work? The user takes a random seed, generates a random circuit, he knows the circuit, he executes the random circuits and gets bit streams and then time stems that. And there'll be some biases and you can extract that in some ways, you can deal with that practical things. But then what you do is you take a bunch of those bit streams and you do a cross entropy benchmarking verification to say, okay, uh, that came from a quantum quantum circuit, okay, and, and came from the particular quantum circuit. And this is exactly what I showed you. You can verify that it came from that. But then, of course, you want to know, did it really come from hardware or did someone spoof that? And what you can do is you can check the timestamp. And because the compute on the supercomputer is going to take a lot longer for these large numbers, large bit streams, then a classical computer, you from the timestamp, you know it came from a quantum computer, it came from hardware, and that it's truly random. So, uh, so uh, this, uh, the, you know, this would uh, enable you to have a new kind of cryptographic system that's uh, that's not there. So it's interesting. Some people are working on it, and uh, we'll see if if it really uh, makes a, a difference in the cryptography world. But uh, um, Actually, you know, uh, some people are thinking about it for elections and also for choosing judges, uh, you know, so that you make sure you, you reduce the chance of fraud, uh, fraud doing that by, by having a very secure random number generator. Let's go on to, uh, I think, which is a more generic uh, use, and that is quantum, quantum chemistry. And with this great uh, processor that works really well, you can now run complex algorithms. So. Uh, quantum chemistry on the Sycamore device. Uh, this is basically the original idea of Feynman to solve quantum problems on a quantum computer. And what, you, of course, you have to do, you first have to solve your quantum problem. In this case, quantum chemistry, how does a atom, atoms bind in a molecule, map it to a quantum computer. And that's what's been going on for 20, 30 years now. And they have pretty efficient ways of doing that. So you have to compile your chemistry into your qubits, Hartree-Fock, fermionic operators, what are the control sequences, suite of measurements. And, you know, for example, a hydrogen-6 molecule, these are your basic or orbitals of the system. And then you, uh, you, excite, you excite half of them. You have a bunch of swap gates that you calibrate based on all this chemistry. You measure it in a, a, a variety of ways, and then you can compute energies. And what's nice about this is there's some conservation laws in, in this. For example, these are non-excitation number uh, things. So you only look at results here that have, if there's three ones at the input, there has to be three ones at the output. And you use that conservation law. So you do a bunch of things. You vari variational optimize this and you can get the, the, the chemistry uh, value. So 
This is an example from a, a string of 12 hydrogen atoms. Of course, that's not seen in nature, but it's a fine benchmark problem for a quantum computer. And the blue uh, dots are the, uh, the data coming from the quantum computer. And the black line is the simulation, uh, classical computer results. And you see very good, uh, very good uh, results. And here's uh, showing the errors. And in fact, if you back off a little bit and go to, I think it's H6 or H8, you can actually get chemical accuracy is what the chemists need for their accuracy to be able to predict things in the real world. So it works well. They've looked at other systems too. This is double the number of qubits, electrons, prior chemistry simulations, more than 10 times the number of gates. We're now at the realm that we're doing very complex calculations and really testing in detail how these algorithms work. And what's nice is we have the new uh, uh, Sycamore processor and some variants of that. We have a programming language called CERC, how, uh, how to program the device. And then we have something called Open Fermion, does, which does this compiling chemistry to qubits. So there's a suite of tools at Google to run these very advanced algorithms. And uh, we're, the, the cloud, we're, we're gonna have come out with a, a cloud service as other companies have done. And that'll be coming out. People are trying and using it right now. And uh, we think it'll be great that the scientific community can test more ideas with this. And just to give you an idea of what's possible, here's a series of complex experiments we've done on the Sycamore and other variants, you know, smaller chips of that. Hartree-Fock, uh, quantum adiabatic optimization, out of, out of time order uh, correlator, a fermi hubbler uh, model, which is something that's often done in, in atom systems. And the thing I wanna talk about here is the total number of gates that we're running in these experiments. Um, uh, roughly about a thousand, okay? And you kind of think of this as roughly a quantum volume-ish kind of metric. How many gates can you do? What's the complexity of the algorithms that you can do? And it's now of the order of a thousand with our device. And what's interesting about that magnitude is at a thousand, you're really beginning to run complex algorithms. Uh, it's still something you can uh, calculate on your laptop but uh, you're running uh, complex algorithms and you can test how good your algorithms are and how sensitive they are to noise because these are noisy devices. And we think that's going to really bring the, the field forward, kind of the next order of magnitude and testing other algorithms and seeing how things are going. So I think that's, a, that's an exciting time for us. Um, we're working on error correction. Uh, uh, because in the end, you want to build an error-corrected quantum computer so you don't have any errors and you can run the full quantum algorithms. And basically, what you worry about that is the two-qubit error and the number of qubits. The goals are getting the two-qubit error down to about 10 to minus 3, the number of qubits, say, up to about a million, and we can know we can do useful algorithms at that point. And I would say what happened in the last seven years when we went from UCSB to Google, we went from a 1D array with two, two near, nearest neighbor coupling to a 2D array with four nearest neighbors, which is error correction surface code compatible. We made it better. We know there are some devices that are work pretty well. So we're kind of working on, yeah, you know, getting on this, this line. And we feel optimistic that we can get there. And it's just a lot more, a lot more work to do that. But, but you know, th things are progressing forward. So in terms of kind of summarizing this, we've demonstrated quantum supremacy. We've demonstrated to a good degree that all the quantum physics is working. In some sense, it's justifying even more that we put more research uh, money into this to try to build a quantum computer. My statement is always that building a quantum computer is really hard and you know it, it might not work, but there's certainly things working well enough that it justifies you know, putting the money in and trying to work hard and get it to work. And I'm optimistic about it, but it, this is a hard problem, okay? Uh, in terms of, let's say, using the quantum computer, say on this cloud, uh, one of the things is quantum computers are not a commodity. The performance matters greatly because the power is exponential with the performance. So this is driving all the hardware people to make really good qubits. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. 
Uh, the breakthrough of the quantum supremacy enables better performance in future devices. Things are looking well. And right now we're, we're looking hard at algorithms because we have a powerful quantum computer. If someone were to find the right algorithm, maybe you can build a powerful and useful one at the time. It's kind of one good idea away. I think it's more likely that we have to make the quantum computers better and we have to make the algorithms better. But you know that could happen in the next few years or maybe longer, we don't know. But we're certainly in an interesting time where we're you know, on this useful race and people are working hard, hard about that, hard on that. So at that, let me just, uh, uh, you know, this was done on the big team. Obviously there's a lot of theory work. There's a lot of experimental work, a lot of uh, engineering work going into this. This is actually the team uh, about two years ago. It, it's grown since then. And, uh, you know, uh, many, many clever ideas by people to get this to work. And, uh, you know, hats off to uh, all the teamwork that involved in, in getting this to work. So, okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. This was a fantastic talk. Um, so I guess now I welcome uh, questions, I guess, from the audience um, for John. Great. Sorry, I have a, I didn't understand the definition of quantum supremacy. I mean, it is, how do you define it? I mean, is it a supremacy of the stopped clock versus the running clock that's good only in one time during the day? Or is, uh, do you test it on a variety of tasks? So, and with which yeah. measure, I mean, what weight you give to a given task to understand yeah. what supremacy means? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. You know, John Presco wrote about this, I don't know, 10 years ago. So he has a very concrete definition if you want to go to that. But it basically says, find a concrete task. And then, you know, how long does it take to classically solve the problem? And how long does it take for a quantum computer to solve the problem? So the particular problem here is the sampling outputs of a, uh, you know, a random circuit. And so that's a concrete ca uh, calculational task. And you, again, we write this cross entropy benchmarking as a benchmark for the task. And like I said, uh, 200 seconds quantum computer sampling uh, would take, you know, year, years, thousand years to do on a classical computer. We know the scaling, you know, we've done all the computer science to know, and we've done all the checks and the proxies to show that that would work. So uh, it, it's for it's for one computational task. And uh, again, uh, and, and, and I would say, you know, that's nice. It shows power, quantum computers are powerful. We all understood that the quantum supremacy benchmark was a milestone along the way to then do something useful. Okay, so, so that's what we're working on next. Did, did that help? Yes, so it's task dependent. I mean, this definition that's, depends on, on. Yeah, and you choose any task. Okay, that's what was nice about it is uh, uh, you you choose any task just to show that the quantum computer is is powerful. So, and that's a good benchmark, right? Uh, that that shows a lot. And again, I would say one of the things I liked about that benchmark and why I was drawn to it is, of course, it's an important benchmark and. You know, people will want to fund you, whatever, but it also tests the science of, 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 of a quantum computer. And you will definitely know if something goes wrong with your quantum computer. And, and as you're building hardware and doing an experiment, you really want metrics and a, a methodology to tell if things are going wrong. Because that's like the standard, <laughs> standard case for experiments, right? And then you use this to figure it out, figure out what's wrong and, and optimize it. Thanks. Any other question? Okay, I, I have a little bit of a technical question, uh, which is maybe you mentioned this already, but in a regime that you cannot easily check with the classical computers, uh, and especially with a uh, few per thousand uh, uh, success probabilities, do we actually know which uh, sample uh, result is actually correct? Um, so, uh, so uh, um, you know, because the the you know, you have real errors, your success probability goes down over time well, with, with the number of qubits. And at the end, it's a little bit less than 1%. Uh, 
But the stati- we're, we're taking millions of events, so the statistical uncertainty on that number, five sigma statistical uncertainty, is different than zero. And if there was, was an error, it goes to zero. Okay, we know that. So uh, we know that it's statistically uh, uh, different than zero. And uh, again, uh, the, the numbers we get are, are predictable. We understand all the physics. There's no, nothing weird going on here. I, I guess I'm not wondering about the the actual histogram and the distribution, but I'm just wondering: uh, uh, Do you can you actually basically can you actually post select and know that you know these uh, less than one percent these particular results are correct, or or is that is that not known? No, no, uh, these particular results are correct because if it weren't correct. If there was, you know, we, we know, we, well, okay, let's, let me be a little bit more, more precise. We know that 1% of the errors are correct and 99% of the time you had an error. But if there was you know any- which ones are correct? Yeah. Excuse me? Once the, so do you know which ones are correct? In other words, uh, does, is the post-selection process uh, uh, polynomially uh, uh, doable? Yeah, um, uh, the, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, you can check which of the events are the higher probability events when you check it. You can't tell from the quantum computer, but you can check them with the classical, and and, and that's right. But you know, in the end, uh, and you you still have a low number of events. Now, if you, you and and you can show people did the computer science calculation for a sampling. You have to factor in the effect that uh, when, when, you, when you try to say that you outperformed a classical computer, you have to, out, you have to factor in uh, the sampling, the statistics of the, of the 1%. And uh, the, the theory group did that properly. And in fact, you have, to, uh, you, have to, um, you have to make it easier for the classical computer uh, because of that, because it only has to be right 1% of the time. So that, that's put into the calculations, but it's such a big gap in time that those, those things really don't matter. It, okay. you, you should go in, if, if you're, if, it's good that people are thinking about the details of this and the, the theory group at Google have written extensively about you know, all these issues. And you'll, you'll find that in the supplement of our paper. Okay, thanks. I believe, yeah. okay. I believe Thank you. Kara, question? Yeah. yeah, Kara, I guess has, Kara, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I had a question about the application of the quantum supremacy, um, I guess, algorithm that you mentioned. Um, so you were talking about uh, you could imagine using this to like securely uh, generate some random numbers. Um, and I was wondering if it's still secure if the hacker has their own quantum computer so in that case, like, could someone generate their own list of random numbers that has the right signature of a quantum computer, but then maybe just generate random numbers so they get random numbers that they want and then somehow interfere with that? Like, is it still secure in that way? Yeah, that's a good question. That's the, that's the conventional way that a hacker would do is you would have a table of random numbers with, say, the right statistics. Uh, so that you know you could you could do that, but you know the numbers. But the important new thing about this is the timestamp. When you're generating a random number, you give it a, you 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 start the thing, you give it you give it a, a random number, and you generate the, the 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 circuit, and you get the data back. Let's say in a few seconds. But if you were to spoof it with a classical computer in the way you're talking about that. That would take, let's, let's say, a day in, to get that data. And because you have the timestamp, you know that the real-time data you're, that you're getting back from that is, is correct. And of course, you have to check it for that, but you, you store that data and you know it's good. So it's the timestamping part and the fact that you know that it's, you've computed, theoretically, that it's classically hard, which people have done, uh, that's the that's the kind of key to to that, right? And you the, can actually check that that it came from a particular piece of hardware because it came so fast. I guess the the question is really like, if 
if you're not trying to spoof it with a classical computer, but if you have your own quantum computer that you are trying to spoof this data with, like, is it still secure? So if, if uh, well, I think it would be secure to yourself because you've got the results out of the, the, the classical uh, computer. I have to think about this, but I think that's correct. But uh, if, uh, um, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, but then, then you're just generating your own random numbers. I mean, in the end, you have to trust something. You have to trust your own software. You have to have your own software audited. So uh, um, maybe it, it, that goes along the line to that kind of, uh, kind of thing. The, the, you, you have to think very carefully about uh, security uh, and, and uh, uh, the security people, you know, talk about very little. But I think in the end, you have to trust something. You have to trust your own computer. I think that's the answer to that. But I, 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 I appreciate you thinking about it. And, you know, if there's something that comes up to be a problem, people will want to know about that. Uh, it, because they're trying to think of all the possible ways that things can go wrong when you're looking at security systems. That's how you make it secure. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Uh, I have a question. It's just a curiosity. Uh, just uh, listening to the news, in this case, where the Japanese public TV, and they announced that Toshiba has uh, com is commercializing a quantum uh, key distribution system, so uh, which is again a form of quantum cryptography. And I was a bit surprised because I thought uh, that. Uh, we are not yet at the stage of having actually commercial devices. We are still at the phase of research. So. Well, in terms of quantum key distribution, uh, there's a company, uh, ID Quantique, I think in Switzerland, who's had commercial systems for years and years now, mm -hmm. um, you know, five years or so, and they've run tests. But the real problem with those systems is that um, uh, the, the distance over which you can communicate your uh, quantum key is, is not that big. And the people are thinking about repeaters and other things. So, so you know, first of all, I don't think it's new. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my, but it might be fine for Japan. Japan's a small company. If you want to do that around Tokyo, uh, maybe that makes sense. So uh, that would be, uh, be interesting. Um, you know, uh, quantum key distribution uh, uh, systems are interesting, but you really need to talk to the security experts whether they feel that that's more enhanced with what people have right now. And uh, um, the security people think very differently than physicists. So you want to be careful about, you know, how commercially relevant uh, this is. And I think people are still trying to understand uh, those systems. Thank you, John. Uh, we have one question from actually one of our students, Josh. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, thanks for your talk. I was wondering um, <clears throat> what your opinion was for like reducing the noise of your uh, of your quantum computer. Uh, what, do you do you do you improve the queue or are you trying to use different materials or what direction do you think is the best direction? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I really like that question because it gets to the heart of everything. And, uh, you know, we've been working on making the qubits better for, I don't know, 30 years or so, for a long, long time for our group and many other groups. And, uh, you know, it, it's a very complicated issue. And I would say, you know, for one, uh, one of the big, uh, big uh, things for the decoherence is the uh, surface oxide, say of the aluminum, there's a few nanometer surface oxide on the aluminum and that has a, a loss tangent about 10 to minus three. So even though it's a very small volume, it actually has a fairly large effect. So we've worked on that and redesigning that. Uh, and also I would say the other big thing is when you build, go from one qubit to many qubits, it's very easy to get crosstalk and radiation and all these things happening. So there was a lot of um, good physics engineering and microwave engineering uh, going on so that you don't radiate and you don't uh, do it. So there's a long, there's a very long list of, of things that 
uh, the whole field has been working on for a long time. But I would say at this point, uh, uh, what, what's interesting is our coherence time is about 20, 20 uh, microseconds. And many other groups gets hundreds of microseconds, even a millisecond. And, uh, you know, it, I think ours was small because we built a complex circuit and it's hard to, to get things to work well when you have all these, these qubits around and all these things can go wrong. But I, I personally feel like we can get our qubit coherence much higher, uh, you know, on the order of what other people are doing uh, so that uh, then the errors will go down. And, you know, we need about a factor of five lower errors. And I think it's extremely likely we can get up to hundreds of microseconds for these qubits and, uh, and then do that. But it's, it's a lot of careful engineering and physics testing, experimental work to figure out what's going wrong. And that's what's happening now with the Google team. Wonderful. Can I ask a question about, about scaling of this? I mean, these devices are still fairly big. Um, are, do you expect to be able to get to thousands of qubits and up to the, the, the graph you showed with, with this technology? Is there a way to scale it such that uh, you can get, get to those sizes without having enormous uh, areas uh, associated with your qubits? Yeah, okay, thank you. That's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, um, about a year and a half ago, I figured out how to scale to a million qubits. And, uh, uh, you know, you have to think like a high energy physicist a little bit to, to do that. Um, unfortunately, uh, that was when I worked at Google and Google doesn't want me talking about it in detail. So, but Google's talking about that's what they want to do. And so, you know, but, but there are, you know, in fact, the technology to scale I had been working on for three to four years, uh, you know, on, at Google. So I kind of know what's involved and, in, you know, I know that it looks really pretty good and it, I think it will work very well. Um, but I, I do want to say, so, you know, sorry, but a thousand qubits, there's absolutely no question in my mind that we can do that. Okay, just no, no problem at all. Going to million uh, re requires uh, you to think boldly, <laughs> like a high energy physicist, but okay, I, I think it can be done. Certainly there's a roadmap and then people figure out things in the meantime, it should get easier. I do want to go back to one of the things you said in the beginning about the size of the devices. They are quite large. And of course, that means you're going to build a relatively big quantum computer. But when you look at the sizes for a million qubits, it's still, it's not like it's a, it's a football field. It's like, a, you know, it's a big cryostat, which people know how to make. Again, high energy physicists. But I want to go back to something very fundamental. In a classical computer, uh, you know, you're, you basically have a power supply, a zero and one volt or whatever, and then you, you run your logic. When you have a quantum computer, you have, you have a lot of control to, 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 to do that. And that control is, it, 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 it's physical hardware, it consumes power. And I would also like to say there's a lot of information content to that control. And just to give you an idea of that, for each qubit that we calibrated to do this experiment, there's about a hundred uh, you know, uh, parameters that you have to measure and adjust and optimize. So you can see there's actually quite a lot of information in getting this to work. So there, there's, it is kind of, you, you have to have a classical control system with that information and you have to match it to your qubit in some way on chip with wires, however you want to do it. And I, what I would say is that that kind of information matching kind of says you want a little bit large qubits because how else are you going to build electronics and build a control system that has that information? So, uh, so, you know, large qubits are actually useful. I mean, this is why we can't make a quantum computer out of molecules, right? We can't get, I well, can't wire it. And the, it, I think the constraints are even more severe than the wires because you actually have, have information that requires volume. I mean, to, to have that information. Now, people may, can maybe invent qubits that require less fine tuning 
than, than we're doing. And so who knows how good this argument is, but there is some kind of practical constraint there and big, but not too big might be good. Thank you. Thanks, it is a very right. interesting question to think about what your practical constraints are there. Great. Kara has one more question and maybe that's the last question. Great. Sure. Sorry, I just wanted to follow up on, on the question I asked earlier. I think maybe I just didn't ask it very clearly. So I just wanted to try it again because I'm, I'm really interested in the security of this algorithm. So let's say you have like, you know, Alice and Bob. Alice is trying to send a random number to Bob with her quantum computer at, at Google. Um, but then you have Eve is a hacker. She's at IBM and she has her own quantum computer. Uh, and she wants to interfere with this communication and send some other like predetermined value to Bob and make it look like it was a random number uh, from the Google quantum computer. Could she like use her own quantum computer to generate uh, something that looks like a random number or something that looks like the, the random distribution uh, from the Google quantum computer uh, that has the appropriate timestamps and still interfere with that communication? Or is the best she can do just generate other random numbers and still give Bob random numbers at the end of the day, if that's clear? Yeah, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, yeah, th there's this, you're using the standard uh, language of Alice, Bob, Eve, Stroffer. And this is a little bit different security issue. This is an issue that you want to generate a random number to do whatever you want to do with it. And of course, you can communicate with it. So it's different. And uh, uh, you, you, let's say you're going to use an external quantum computer at Google. In that case, it's a, it's a little bit uh, different. So um, uh, 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 let's see. So if, if uh, instead of getting my, if someone hacked into it and had their own quantum computer and gave me random numbers, so it came from an outside company instead of Google, uh, then, uh, yeah, then, but you know, I don't think you care what, what quantum computer it came from. Uh, uh, you know, you're just generating a random number and, uh, uh, you know, you're going to use that. Now, if you're going to use that random number to do secure communications, then you have to worry about that. And then you, you do that, but many applications, uh, you know, all you want is a random number and you don't care if that random number is public. And then that would be the case. So, so uh, I may, maybe this is a little bit different uh, application than secure communication. I think if you have secure communication, you would have to make sure that the quantum computer was within your domain and, uh, and secure. I, 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 I'm thinking that, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, you, yeah, I guess in that picture, you may need entanglement between the quantum computers or whatever that is going back and forth. This would be another, it would be another protocol. But That's if right. you if you're just want a random number and it's yeah. okay if the public knows that number, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then, uh, you know, the, 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 the application that the NIST people told us is, is uh, is choosing judges for court cases because if you steer it to the right judge, you can do that. And the, the people want to make sure that they're cho they're getting using a real random number to figure out which judge to choose. Okay, and that random number can be public. Okay, but you just want to make sure it's absolutely random. So right now, uh, in other countries, they use the random number generator at NIST because they kind of trust it that you know the U.S. government is gonna is gonna be okay. So, uh, but you know, after the last few months, okay, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So there's one more question. If you you still have time, and I promise this is the last one. We have another PhD student, uh, Shu Zhang. Do you want to ask? Good yeah. question. Hi, Hi, professor. Thank you for for your talk. Uh, just uh, I have just uh, I just have a question out of the the curiosity. And so, do you have a prediction that when the Practical quantum computer will be uh, uh, will go to our daily life in the future. Uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a good a good question. Um, the one question I can ask answer is the Google um, group has been talking publicly 
about a 10 year plan to build a million qubit error corrected quantum computer. And at that point, there are some scientific algorithms and algorithms to run where you know, you, you know it's gonna be, have an impact on science. Whether it's going to impact your life, you know, I don't know. And then people are working on uh, uh, algorithms in the near term, uh, that's the case. And, and you know, p there's a big area of research on optimization problems and solving the, the traveling salesman problem kind, kind of problem faster. And if that could be done on a quantum computer, and it's a big if, but people are working on it, then that will enter into business really fast because that's a very generic problem. And that will be impacting businesses and your life, in, at least indirectly, uh, you know, uh, quite soon. But that's a big if, but a lot of people are working on it. So we don't know. That's kind of what's interesting is, uh, is uh, you know, it's, it's just a big area of research right now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. Thanks uh, for being patient with us and answering all the questions and for a fantastic talk. Let's okay. thank John again, I guess, virtually or... <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I enjoyed the questions and giving the talk. Wonderful. Fantastic. I'm going to end the recording. Okay.